All right, thank you so much to everybody for being here tonight for Montgomery for All's April meeting. I'm going to give some background before we jump into our conversation with Councilmember Hans Riemer. Um, I guess I should introduce myself. I often forget to do that. Uh, my name is Jane Lyons, and I'm the Maryland Advocacy Manager with the Coalition for Smarter Growth and the organizer for Montgomery for All. So a little bit about Montgomery for All. For many of you, this might be your first meeting. Uh, in short, Montgomery for All, we are a grassroots group organized by the Coalition for Smarter Growth. We are advocating for a general plan that paves the way for a more equitable, prosperous, and sustainable future. So we're pretty much exclusively focused on the general plan. Um, although we then, after we win a really awesome general plan, we want to pivot to focusing on implementing the general plan. So our platform for the general plan has 10 goals and some of those goals are to allow for more housing options, protect vulnerable communities, providing equitable safe access to amenities, building a world-class transit network and more. So, and then a little bit about the Coalition for Smarter Growth. So we are a regional advocacy nonprofit uh, founded in 1997 and we work across the region, uh, the DC region. So we have staff in Northern Virginia, DC and Maryland. We are pretty small, but mighty. Um, and we work on the issues of housing, transit, and land use. Our vision for the region is to have a network of walkable, inclusive, transit-oriented communities. And recently, um, interpreting recently a bit broadly, we've advocated for in one bus rapid transit, the purple line, the end to the housing moratorium, keeping ride on free. Uh, that one's a little bit more recent, keeping it free through the, at least the, the end of June and the end of the state of emergency for the pandemic and accessory dwelling units. And I'm glad to say that Hans Riemer has played a role in I think all of those things. Uh, so uh, uh, great to have him here tonight. Uh, he's been involved in making a lot of this stuff happen. So uh, some updates. Uh, this is a picture, a fun screen cap from the last meeting that we had, which was a little bit different. We did a virtual social hour in this virtual rooftop bar that kind of looked like a, it was like eight bit um, video game. And so you can see the, the smiling faces of, <laughs> of some of the members there. And that was super fun. So thanks to everybody who, who stuck with us through trying out that new technology. I am excited to hopefully have an in-person happy hour sometime the next, hopefully next few months and meet a lot of you in person. So uh, other updates, the planning board draft of Thrive 2050, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about before we get into our conversation, uh, but the planning board draft of Thrive 2050 is complete. It has been sent to the county council. So it is in their hands now, which is exactly what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, and the county council public hearings will be, potentially plural, we're not sure, will be sometime in early May, if there is question mark, if there's any insight that, uh, that uh, Hans, you can provide into that uh, when we get into it, that would be super helpful. Uh, but we'll be putting together an advocacy packet that will have information on how to sign up to testify, um, how to write testimony, um, sample talking points of things that we like in the plan, things that we would like to see in the plan. Um, so hopefully everything that you need, and that will be coming out really as, as soon as the public hearings are scheduled, because uh, we want to make sure that as many uh, community members have a voice in this process as well, and are advocating for the goals that Montgomery for All adopted. So, um, not everybody knows what a general plan is. So before we talk nitty gritty about the general plan, I uh, just wanna go over that. It's a blueprint essentially for how and where the county is gonna grow over the next 30 plus years. It requires implementation. So on its own, it's not gonna change any zoning or any policies at all, uh, but it will guide the work of done in the planning department and at the county council on planning issues, so issues related to housing, to transportation, land use, environmental protection. Um, and another important point is that it hasn't been comprehensively updated since 1969. And a lot has changed in the county since 1969. Um, and the way that we've grown since then has exacerbated segregation. We're still a very racially and economically segregated county. 
um, and climate change. Uh, we've had a really tough time cutting down uh, emissions, especially from the transportation sector. Uh, and so what Montgomery for All is all about is setting the county on a new course to create neighborhoods that are mixed income, that are diverse, sustainable, and prosperous. Um, Thrive 2050 is looking at these eight issue areas uh, in the dark blue, and then looking at all of those different issues through the three lenses of economic health, community equity, and environmental resilience, because it's not enough to look at any one of those things on its own, we need to be thinking about them in everything else that we do. This uh, is the map from the new draft of Thrive 2050. I'm personally not sure how I feel about it. Um, it's a little bit confusing to me and I would be interested um, to hear from the people on the call about if it is confusing to you as well. Um, it shows where in the county uh, we have rural areas for agriculture, sort of the dark bluish purple there, areas for limited growth, what was previously called the like suburban wedge, and then areas for corridor focused growth. And the growth corridors are those um, sort of thicker black lines there. Um, so major roads like 355, 29, uh, Georgia, Beers Mill, um, you can see them all listed there. And then there's also uh, an additional aspect of, you know, where are where within those corridors do we really want to focus growth? Because it's not enough to just have corridors, you need centers as well. So the red circles are the large centers like Bethesda, Silver Spring, Glenmont, Rockville, uh, places that have a lot of these larger metro station areas. Then we have the medium centers and the orange, the smaller centers and the purple, and then villages and neighborhood centers in the green. Um, so uh, I, th I think that this is interesting and uh, I am interested to hear people's thoughts on it as well. It's not really a map that came together towards a little bit of the end of the process. So I haven't really heard personally from people's on their thoughts about it yet. And, you know, when we're evolving the county to be more, to be more inclusive and transit oriented, what does that actually look like? So here are some fun mock-ups that are included in the new draft of the plan, um, or at least I find them very fun to look at and to imagine what does that mean to change the shape of our communities to fit these values. Here's another one. Um, and so I think this is my last slide on this. Uh, what do we think of the plan? So after, after reviewing it, um, we're very excited about, and honestly not a lot of content necessarily has changed in the plan. If you were familiar with, with what was in the planning staff draft, the planning board draft with content is honestly very similar. They mostly just made it a much uh, sleeker document that flows a little bit better, although there were some, some changes that were pretty substantial. So we're excited that it's embracing sustainable, inclusive urbanism. Casey Anderson, the planning board chair, just published a, a blog post about embracing unapologetic urbanism. So that's super exciting. We're excited about creating more diverse mixed income communities, evolving single family neighborhoods near transit, planning for people instead of cars and making the county more affordable. Uh, we would like to see even more uh, discussion about eliminating racial and economic segregation, um, a better map of centers and corridors and, few, and where future growth should go. Um, as I was alluding to and looking at that map, I think that it could maybe be improved or tweaked uh, to be a little bit easier to understand and a little bit more inspiring, but, but we'll see what can be done there. Uh, we'd like to see the environmental chapter added back in. All of the environmental stuff was sort of spread, tried to spread throughout some of the other chapters and then wrapped in with the parks and rec chapter, but it feels like a lot's kind of missing now related to that. We'd like to see more integration with the county's climate action plan. Um, especially on issues like that we're certainly at risk for, like uh, heat island effect and uh, increased flooding. And also to think even more boldly about deeply affordable housing. There's a lot of great ideas about how to get more market rate affordable or market rate housing, which is super important and we are strongly uh, all about. Uh, but it seems like a lot of the ideas around deeply affordable housing, housing for people with the lowest incomes is just sort of doing more of what we've already in doing um, and not necessarily thinking as maybe creatively as we could be. So with that, that is Montgomery for all thoughts on the plan, very quick and brief there. 
um, have a lot more thoughts to get into, but now I'm excited to introduce council member Hans Reamer, who is an at-large council member in Montgomery County. So if you live in Montgomery County, he is your council member. Uh, and he is also the chair of the Planning, Housing and Economic Development Committee, often referred to as FED. Um, and this is the committee that will be overseeing the review of Drive 2050. So Hans plays a super important role and um, we're very lucky to have him here tonight to talk to us a little bit about what he sees as the future of Montgomery County um, and how Thrive can help us help us visualize that future, imagine that future, um, and then just sort of what, what his thoughts on Thrive are. Uh, so with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I will hand it over to you, Councilmember Reamer. All right, Jane, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Do I, do I need to keep admitting people or will someone else be able to oh, do Oh no, that? Emily is doing that. So okay. you, you don't have to worry about that at all. <laughs> I see so many of my friends' names popping up as wanting to get in the room. I'm sorry, while trying to admit somebody, I accidentally muted you. So there you go. <laughs> you should be able to unmute again though. All right, I'm okay. unmuted. Well, I'm glad to be here. This is gonna be a fun discussion. Um, thank you to Jane and, and the Coalition for Smarter Growth and everyone who's on this call. I think almost everyone on this call is, Someone I recognize from the work that we've done together over the last, you know, ten years. Um, you've been in the trenches. You've been advocating, testifying on social media. You know, part of different master plans, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, I, I thought it was really fun to get a chance to be here at this moment because it, it feels like we are kind of tying the bow or really, it's an important moment in a movement and uh, transforming the rewriting the general plan of Montgomery County, I think is symbolically very important um, because you know, who we are as a community and, and what our vision is of the future has you know, been very much up, in, uh, up for debate and it's been a work in progress. And I think that this coalition has made tremendous strides and has uh, in many ways um, taken, taken more than just a seat at the table, uh, but is sort of chairing the conversation in a lot of ways. And um, so to have the opportunity from, from that posture to be able to work on rewriting the general plan, I think is really exciting. You know, when I first joined the council in 2010, uh, the word urban uh, was kind of a, a, un, a word that shall not be spoken. Um, and I, I remember, you know, interviews as a candidate, uh, you know, and talking about whether it was safe to talk about Montgomery County as a, as a place where we wanted urban areas. Um, and, you know, the general feeling was, no, you didn't want to say that. You didn't want to do that. Uh, you know, that we were a suburban community, uh, maybe even a rural community, uh, but we did not want urban areas and, uh, you know, we should not try to create them. I think that was kind of the mentality uh, for a really long time. But I think we have gradually through, you know, smart thinking and, and effective planning, you know, brought the county to a stronger foundation to the point where today, I think we have a different political coalition. We have a, we have a foundation now, I think that supports smart growth in a way that we didn't have, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I think if you want to do significant development around downtown Bethesda or downtown Silver Spring, you can do that now uh, without necessarily having your head chopped off. Uh, or you might have it chopped off, but uh, you know, you, you, it grows back. Um, and I think that's really, I think that's important to recognize. So first of all, that politically in the county, I think there's a stronger consensus to support these kinds of changes. And that's been hard fought and hard won. And I think to be, you know, to, to be rewriting this plan at that moment, uh, in this moment is, is important. Um, I wanna give a shout out to my friend, Casey Anderson, who I, I don't know how well it's known, but Casey and I are close friends. 
I met him when I was knocking on doors in 2006. Uh, I knocked on his door and we started talking about a transportation issue. And I think we talked for about an hour, maybe an hour and a half on his doorstep. And then he ended up grabbing a clipboard and continuing to canvas in his Woodside neighborhood uh, to, to help me. Um, and we, we became close friends subsequently, partly through our love of bikes, but also substantially our love of planning, you know, housing, economic development, urbanism, transportation, all these things fitting together. And so it's fun to be able to work on this with him as now chair of the planning board and uh, we're, well, me as chair of the planning committee uh, at the council. So, you know, we're gonna have a good time with this. Um, a few contextual points I wanted to, to say. Again, I think that personally this represents this plan, the vision here, you know, represents personally for me, uh, what I have been pushing for all these many years. Um, you know, the, 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 the urbanism, the, the focus on not only auto transportation, which of course we're gonna continue to have it, but uh, transit and walking and biking. Um, you know, talking about walking, biking and public transportation was, you know, more novel. I mean, we had big issues like the Purple Line that were important battles in the county, but as a general transportation strategy, talking about walking, biking, transportation, uh, public transportation was not necessarily what a lot of council members did. Um, I'm happy to see that today, almost all council members do. Uh, so a lot has changed uh, and you've been a big part of that and, and I appreciate that. Um, we, we have rezoned a lot of the county over the last you know, 15 years. When I, when I arrived at the council, uh, the White Flint One plan was just being finished. And that was a really, really important plan. Um, I think it kind of set the stage for thinking about all the future master plans that, that we would have. Um, in a lot of ways, I think what you see in the general plan is, is a, a bigger exposition of a lot of those same ideas. But um, you know, subsequent to, to White Flint, I mean, we've rezoned most of the major nodes on Rockville Pike. We've rezoned all the nodes on the Purple Line We've done East County, at least the White Oak area. Um, you know, we've done Bethesda with obviously downtown, but even uh, West Bard. We have we have rezoned through the master plans. You know, much of the county, but left unchanged was the kind of more foundational vision of what we were trying to uh, create in a unified way. Um, and you know, it's important to tackle this plan because. Uh, when we did the Veers Mill plan uh, at the beginning of this council term, that was the first plan that I had a chance to steer as chair of the Fed committee. Um, I really wanted to see if we could rezone the single family housing that is on Veers Mill, that as you know, you know, driving on Veers Mill or taking the bus on Veers Mill or biking, you can see at one point it was like a two lane road and it kind of gradually widened out to all the houses and um, now it's a highway. And having knocked on a lot of those doors, you know, I, I, it seemed to me that we, we could do better with the housing the quality of the housing stock. And it, it might be time to, to rezone some of those. However, the planning board said, you know, the planning staff said they didn't feel that they had the authority really to alter single family zoning. Uh, and that while they conceptually agreed that that would be the right thing to do, they actually didn't feel that they were constrained and they couldn't make that recommendation because it wasn't in the general plan. And the general plan had a, has a pretty tight constraint around single family neighborhood zoning. Um, so that's an example of why it's, it really is important for us to change the foundational policy that all of the master plans are built upon. Um, it, I think it's really important for us to take the long view of planning. I want to just sort of characterize the process here a little bit. We have uh, discussed the draft plan a bit at the Fed committee. Um, I think we took it up in the fall and we took it up again, maybe in, in January. Um, and then it went, you know, we just provided some feedback essentially for the planning board. Um, the, the last version that, that we worked on at the committee was 
a little different than what has just passed. I know Chair Anderson took a lot of time to rewrite some of the sections and restructure it a bit. So we have not yet gone through you know, what the new draft is, but in terms of process, that'll be the next step. So now it, it's, it's, it's out of planning, it comes to the council, we'll have public hearings, and then we'll work our way through the document. And ultimately, as with all master plans, as with you know, all, everything that we do, it, it's the county council that finally puts the stamp on the document. And that's what makes it law. Um, and so you know, it could change at the county council. I'm not sure necessarily uh, how much or whether it will, but it certainly can change. Um, and uh, so we, you know, we, I'm glad you're advocating on things you think could, could nevertheless improve and we'll, we'll be able to take those up. Um, you know, one thing that always sticks in my mind is that the original wedges and corridors plan was actually a regional plan. Uh, every wedge of the region, if sort of like a pizza, you know, every slice of the pizza pie was, had its own wedges and corridors. And it was all based around the center being kind of the core of the region. I don't think that's really operable anymore. Um, we now have a region that is growing two cores. Uh, one is DC and another is, is Northern Virginia. And, and the very broad regional context with the explosive growth of jobs, the massive investment of transportation infrastructure, all of that is cascading or it is you know, rippling uh, and, and it's affecting us in, in very profound ways. Um, it affects our housing trends, it affects our job trends, uh, and it affects, I think it will have to affect our strategy for the future. So we do need to kind of re-envision how we do what we do in the context of a region that is no longer what it once was or what it was envisioned to be, uh, because, you know, frankly, Virginia has rewritten the map. You know, they've rewritten the regional plan through their own initiative. And I, I think that's something we haven't really grappled with nearly enough, uh, you know, in this county. Um, and I think, but again, the context is so important, like transportation connections will be more important to Virginia in the future than they were in the past. Um, at the same time, we've got to create our own gravity and our own, you know, momentum here, or else we risk becoming a suburb of, of two cores. And that's not viable for us either. And I know that some of those issues are addressed. Um, but uh, you know, what I love about the plan, I think a lot of the vision here is to help us attract younger workers, which I think 40 years ago, 50 years ago, you know, we, we attracted a lot of younger families. Also, younger workers were younger families you know, in, in a time when if you were 25, you, you might be a lot more likely to be uh, part of a two to earn her household with, with young children. Um, but today, I think we still continue to attract younger families, but we, we aren't as doing as well with attracting younger workers. And we really want them. You know, we wanna be a place where young workers uh, find jobs and then, and then stay. Um, and our community is, is less dynamic when we're not capturing our share of that, uh, that, that valuable resource, you know, the, the brains, the know-how and the income and the cultural uh, value of you know, the younger generation. And I think a lot of this plan is, is focused on the kinds of changes that we know we have to make in order to continue to you know, be with the times. It's a, it's a forward thinking plan. Um, just a few you know, comments and then we can, we can have a discussion. I think the, you know, the, the one thing that is almost overriding of importance visually to me in this plan is and I think Jane, you showed you showed the screen with some of the images, but I'm going to kind of show this picture here. One of the biggest purposes of this plan is to say, in the future, we're going to grow along the corridors. Um, you know, there is a lot there. That that there's a lot of substance in that phrase, and and what it means is that we envision, you know, Route 29 from downtown Silver Spring to Burnsville, ultimately looking very different than it looks today. Um, you know, we sometimes talk about Connecticut Avenue with its many multifamily, you know, apartment buildings, six, eight stories um, as, a, as, a, as a model. Um, 
we, I think that's one of the essential value adds of this plan is envisioning the corridors differently. Um, and that's gonna lead to a lot of um, changes. You're gonna have to, pardon me for one second. Um, so it, the, the, the idea of shifting the corridors over time and making corridors themselves the, the fabric of our growth or the, the landscape of our growth, I think is really, really important. And obviously that's where we can locate a high, high level public transportation. You know, that's where we can transform our existing suburban highways into urbanized roads that have adequate infrastructure for walking and for biking and are highly served by transit and then have very dense housing all around them. So making that vision reality is going to be, you know, the, the uh, we've, we've been doing that, as I mentioned, that's kind of what the White Flint, well, that's exactly what the White Flint plans are about, but um, there's a lot more to do. Um, I, I, I love the focus on complete communities. I, I think the idea of 15 minute living that wherever you are, you ought to be close enough to uh, you know, your basic needs, um, shopping or recreational, uh, you know, a quality bike uh, trail network, you know, park system. Like, I think that's really important. Um, obviously it's a difference from what was once conceived as, you know, some uses over here, other uses over there. Um, I, I love the focus on on transportation and, and bigger thinking. I do think we have to, uh, through this plan, plant some flags about the future of transit in the county, uh, you know, the MARC system, expanding that, thinking about how we can expand Metro or add other high capacity transit systems, uh, how we will use bus transportation on these major corridors. Um, and I love to focus on communications networks. I think you all probably know I've been working for about five years, six years now, trying to pass a zoning change to legalize the next generation of transport of communications infrastructure, which is still not broadly legal in the county. Um, you know, we need to, communications networks will be more important in the future than they are today. And we've got to, to make them a big piece of it, uh, of our planning. Um, a couple of other, you know, random things that come to mind. I, I'm interested to see a bit more about energy use and energy planning. Um, I, I think that we ought to be planning for more self-sufficiency in energy generation. Uh, and I, I'm, I know that that's addressed a little bit, but I, I'm eager to see how we might be able to strengthen some of that. Um, and uh, you know, focusing a bit more on athletics. Uh, I know urban parks is a big, a big goal in our park system. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, both both urban parks and athletics uh, need to be better uh, better embraced in our park strategy. I think we tend to have a, a a vision of parks that is a bit more about the stream valleys and the kind of passive uses. And uh, you know, I think we need to do a bit more to focus on how people use parks at, at kind of at scale. Um, and then the last big piece I'll mention, which is kind of a, a major one, is the affordable and attainable housing. And I touched on that a bit, but you know, this document I hope will provide the mandate and the authority to rethink how we provide housing in this county. And you know, the basic framework uh, is one that I strongly support, which is that every neighborhood should have a diversity of housing types. Um, you know, every neighborhood should uh, that. Having diverse housing types will create communities that are more complex, they're more diverse, and they're accessible to people at different income levels. And unfortunately, you know, the historic, the historic, uh, historically, a lot of communities were zoned as either single family over here, and then we put the apartment over there. Uh, and actually, you see that in you see that in Silver Spring. You know, Potomac was zoned single family, high density housing was put in Silver Spring. You know, that's a story you'll hear from those who were involved in land use politics, you know, of the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, 
And you know that's not that's not desirable. It's not sustainable, and we need to rework our land use in the county so that you know every neighborhood could have housing that there's one building on the lot, there's two buildings on the lot, or you know there's an apartment building in the neighborhood. Like every neighborhood should have that diversity of types, and I think every school district should have that diversity of types. I don't think it's you know right or desirable to have some schools where the boundaries of the of the school are almost entirely you know residents of high density perhaps lower income apartment communities and then others where almost all the housing is uh, all the students are from expansive lots you know of you know single family estates um, so those are those are difficult challenges no no doubt but I look forward to working on that challenge because I, I think it's an important one and uh, it's one that we have to you know, get right. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Jane, and I'd love to uh, participate in some good dialogue. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Councilmember Reamer. Um, to, to all of the attendees, I have changed the chat setting so you can now put your questions in the chat. Um, and yes, I'm, I really appreciate all of those, all of those remarks. I especially appreciate the, the last point that you were making about a diversity of housing types, but especially a, diver a diversity of housing types within school districts. Um, because, um, something that we've been talking about a lot as an organization is that, you know, it's important to focus the zoning changes around transit corridors um, to have that transit oriented development. But if we really want to get at some of the um, some of the um, segregation that still exists today in schools and in neighborhoods, that it's also important to consider those other types of community amenities, primarily being schools. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I will say, like on the you know, to to be fair about it, if, if you look at the master plans over the last 20 years, 30 years. Generally what you see, if it's like a large scale development, like a, like a Clarksburg, for example. Clarksburg has a diversity of housing types. You know, it's got single family, it's got multifamily, it's got townhouse. Uh, I think they actually are building duplexes now. Um, modern planned communities typically have a diversity of housing types, modern ones. But if you go back in history, it was a very different story. It was a very different story. And so, you know, there's, there's just a lot of layers and, and richness to this conversation. All right, uh, so to get started on the questions, cause I'm sure we will have a lot. Um, I had one sort of before I opened up the chat from um, Alan, let's see if I can find you, Alan, I will ask you to unmute yourself. Oh, there you are. So you should have the ability now to unmute yourself if you want and ask your question. Yes. Uh, hi, Hans. How are you? Uh, hey, Ellen. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for all your work. Uh, as a fellow bicyclist, I'm, I'm glad you support, uh, you know, efforts to make things more, more walkable and, and bikeable. Um, but as we move from um, maybe as many places that are single family zoned, uh, especially along the corridors, how do you envisage us keeping Montgomery County literally green and, and attractive and maybe even CO2 absorbing because, you know, at least in the past, uh, often it seems like when you have higher density, the trees go, uh, green spaces go, maybe you pack people, more people into a given, you know, square mile. Um, but it seems in American history to have often been done at the expense of keeping things pleasant and green. And again, with climate change uh, upon us, and how, how do you see that fitting? You know, like how do the two things jive in, in the future going forward. Thank you. Cool. Um, well, that's a very interesting question, Alan. I, I think that historically there was a, a strong sense that, you know, development meant take paving paradise with a parking lot. And I think what we're trying to do is actually kind of unpave the parking lot and put people back on that land. And, um, you know, in Montgomery County, I, I, I don't think there will be a conflict in the future between adding people 
and eating up, you know, environmentally sensitive land or cutting down, you know, important forests that are part of a wildlife ecosystem. You know, we, we are really talking about redevelopment and that's the underlying thrust of the plan is you take a look at Rockville Pike, take a look at Route 29, and how do you take land that's being used less intensively, less efficiently, and make it used and, and allow it to be used more efficiently and more intensively so that other parts of the community that are you know, less, we, that we want to be less dense can continue to be less dense. Um, it's trying to focus that future development. So, you know, I think it gets at an underlying point, which is that smart growth and redevelopment will be the greenest strategy of all, and that allowing you know, really dense development near public transportation and along our corridors is the best way that we can make Montgomery County green and keep it green. Um, I don't. I don't think you're going to see a situation where you know large single-family neighborhoods change into large you know, downtowns, uh, that's not what this plan contemplates. Um, it, it, for, for, for single neighborhoods, I think family neighborhoods, I think, or single unit neighborhoods, you know, it contemplates a much gentler evolution. And one that, you know, where I think that the tree cover of the county will be greater in the future than it is today. And, you know, the streams will be of higher water quality you know, than they are today. And, and really actually, you know, there's probably nothing more important that we could do for stream quality, for example, than ripping up all these parking lots that dump a lot of polluted water into the streams and replacing them with development that filters that water, slows it down uh, and cleans it up. Um, so I, I think that generally speaking, you know, my, my philosophy is you know, development is an environmental benefit in the county. And that is because we are guiding that development appropriately. Um, but you know, historically, it was uh, not viewed that way. Thank you, Alan. I think that's a that's a great response. Um, and and as you were talking about earlier in your remarks, the plan has a big focus on urban parks and to provide communities with better access to existing parks um, and also create through creating new parks and communities. So um, I think that, yeah, the, the goal is to, to turn parking lots into places is something I've heard Gwen Wright, the planning director talk about a lot. And um, I think that's definitely the, the way to go um, and also expand our, our tree canopy, continue to build on that. Um, so, so we're getting a lot of questions as, as I anticipated. So I will um, try to go through them. I won't completely go in order and um, I guess just uh, know now that we likely won't be necessarily able to get to everything, but we will try to. I am going to go now to Ron and ask you to unmute yourself to ask a question if you'd like to. Unmute yourself to ask a question if you'd like to. Hi, everyone. Um, it's Ron here. I, thank you for attending. You had some great answers so far. Um, I had a question, um, what I've been reading about in land use policy, just related to corridor development. You spoke earlier about how you're a fan of like the 15 minute city idea and how even in you know lower density suburban neighborhoods, you can still have most of your needs met with a short walk. Um, that seems a little in, in what's the word I'm looking for? Maybe a little um, in tension with like the corridor plan development. Because when I think of corridors, I'm thinking, you know, on 15 minute walk on each side of the corridor is essentially where you could actually have that uh, 15 minute city be a reality. But most of the county is not within a 15 minute, most of the residential land in the county is not within a 15 minute walking distance of any of the corridors proposed. Um, I don't know, that, that might be wrong, but there's generally a lot of single family suburban. Um, I'm not sure that, that it's walking. Not really I'm near not any sure of the corridors. Walking. I think it's, you know, Within 15 minutes, I, I think it's, you know, but anyway, keep going, please. 
Oh, sorry, oh, Ron. Sorry, I, I thought that was the end of the question. Oh, right. I think yeah. there was an I echo. The the yeah, no, my question is pretty much does does the Thrive 2050 master plan uh, like allow Montgomery County to redevelop a lot of the single family neighborhoods into denser and maybe add in a couple of mixed use um, buildings here and there sprinkled into the, the areas that are far away from the corridors? Or is it pretty pretty set on just the corridor development? Well, um, interesting question. I mean, it's not a zoning plan. So it's, it's a vision guidance document. Uh, it, it's sort of a, yeah, it's, it's a vision document, but it does have some governance in it. So it's because of the general plan now, I think that there's such a restriction on what might be a targeted rezoning of a particular set of single family properties in a particular location. Um, so I think it is, I think it has more allowances, but at the end of the day, for anything in particular to happen, it would need to be either specifically allowed in a, in a master plan or specifically allowed through a change in the zoning code. So those kinds of things are not in this document. Those kinds of things happen through separate action in the future. So, you know, this will be the, the template that, you know, will inform and, and guide future actions and decisions of the County Council. Yeah, do you think that, that that is a really good point though, Ron? And that's something that I plan to bring up in my testimony. Um, it, there, there is a really big emphasis on corridors. And I think to have like the good urban geometry centers are really important. And I think that there has been a recognition in Montgomery County that centers are important. Um, and this concept of corridors is what's new. So that's what gets more focus in the plan. But I, I personally would like to see the plan sort of also make that super strong recommitment to centers because those corridors don't work like the, the spokes of the wheel don't work without the center. Um, so I, I think that that, that that is a good point. Um, next, I will go to Shruti, who I believe had a question about, there seem to be several questions about 5G. So it's definitely a, a point of interest. I think I'm going to limit this to be the one question that is focused on 5G. So I'll have at it, uh, Shruti. Thank you, Jane. And thank you, Council Member Reamer, for your leadership on the council. and. It's been great working with you. I just, I, uh, my understanding is that the Fed committee recently passed the ZTA on 5G wireless with some amendments. So I just wanted to, you to shed some light on that because you talked about energy and communications earlier and I think it's tied to both of those, but your insights would be really helpful just to understand the issue a little bit better on where it is right now. Sure, I'd be happy to give a quick quick uh, update on that. So um, the, Networks that we all use, like you know, when you when you turn on your phone, it's talking to an antenna pretty far off in the distance. Uh, usually, an antenna on top of a building in a downtown, or maybe off in a, in a cell tower, off you know somewhere near a major road, um, because the technology that we use on our phones, the signals travels a long distance, unless you're using Wi-Fi at the house, um, and. We've hit our limit for how many of those kinds of places can hold antennas and we're all adding devices like crazy. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about your house, but my house, I, I think if I were to go into my modem setting, we probably have 25 or 30 devices connected to you know, the network at any one point in time. Um, that's overloading our networks. And in order for us to continue doing what we do today, we have to allow the companies to expand the network capacity. And the problem is they can't, uh, they can't do it enough. And so we're, we're kind of reaching the limit. You know, we're not there today, but we will be there pretty soon. And so what we would like to allow is what other communities around the country have already allowed, which is that a cell phone antenna could be placed on a utility pole or a light pole, you know, at the street level. And that is really essential, not only for continuing to allow us to have well, you know, high functioning 4G networks, but it's also essential to the technology 
you know, the next generation of technology, which is uh, 5G. And 5G is more powerful. It's also less, uh, it, it, less uh, well, it's more powerful. And so you, you know, you're already seeing it. Like my, my iPhone is five, says 5G, but it's not connecting to any 5G antenna because there, there aren't any really in the county. Um, and so uh, we, we've been trying to pass ordinances to legalize uh, you know, the, the antenna placement and unsuccessfully for about five years now. But the Fed committee just a couple of weeks ago did uh, recommend to the full council a new zoning ordinance that will allow us to continue to be, you know, continue to do what we all know that we're doing, recognize reality and, uh, and embrace the future. And it will go to the full council, you know, in the next couple months and, and hopefully we'll actually get it passed. All right, Thank next you. I'm gonna go to Catherine uh, uh, to ask a question about housing. Hello, um, and thank you for being here. I'll just note that I am not the only Catherine in the chat because we are uh, probably people born between uh, the 60s and the 80s when we were all Catherine. That's just how it worked. Uh, I'm Catherine Lucas McKay. Um, I'm interested in hearing more about your ideas on deeply affordable housing, which Jane mentioned earlier. Um, I agree with their general take on it. And I'm interested in like your thoughts on what in Thrive 2050 could better support deeply affordable and really specifically deeply affordable um, as in the for if affordable households making like 33,000 and less, because I think we do a decent job and spend probably more time and money than we should on the 80% to 120%. Sure. Well, first of all, I can share the good news, which is that uh, a couple of weeks ago, the County Council approved a, uh, a fund that I have been working for a year now to, to establish that is for our Housing Opportunities Commission to build new housing of which a good share, maybe 30% of the buildings will be deeply affordable. Um, deeply affordable housing, you know, the market doesn't particularly produce deeply affordable housing. So you must have financing to bring to the table. Um, you know, so it, really I think that is a question of how much effort are we making to create funds, to provide incentives? Are there ways that you know, land use can spur this? You know, maybe. The MPDU program did evolve from a conceptual recommendation of the last general plan uh, the, the late 60s update of the general plan. But, um, you know, I, I think that of critical importance is for the plan to uh, express strong support for deeply affordable housing in all parts of the county. And, you know, to ensure that there is a planning process to make that available and to call on the county government to provide land for that purpose. Um, but at the end of the day, the only way it's going to really happen is if the county government steps up to the plate and helps make it happen through essentially public-private partnerships that finance that, that gap. Um, you know, other than that, I think the single family, like renting rooms in a house, um, can be very affordable, actually. And I think that's that's part of the future is, you know, folks who have a single family house and, you know, want to continue to live in it, but don't want to be alone, uh, maybe can't afford the mortgage or, or the taxes, you know, renting out a couple of rooms in a house. And I think that's a cultural shift that actually I would like to see the plan kind of comment on, but um, that, you know, that is historically one of the other supplies of of the lower, the lowest cost housing in some ways, um, you know, for obvious reasons. But, um, you know, the, the, I did want to share. So the plan that we, the financing plan that we just approved creates a $50 million loan fund for HOC to borrow from to construct buildings. And what, what they do is they will borrow, say, $20 million as part of their capital, build a building, 100 units, 
30, 35 of them set aside for their HOC clients, which is basically that's your, you know, your public assistance tenant. And then they will put the building into a long-term mortgage and then repay the fund. And we anticipate that just from the $50 million fund that we, we established, that they can build somewhere between eight and 900 units of housing a year. And we'd like to increase that. We think that they could double that. But what they need access to in order to double it uh, is not only the money, but the land. So the county needs to be an active partner, helping them secure land, providing them with partnerships and, uh, and making that happen. So uh, those are some of the answers, but I think broadly speaking, it's, it's about mission oriented, mission owned housing. And we need to provide more financing for our nonprofit partners to buy that housing and then put it into long-term ownership. And you know what I would love to see, like for example, the Purple Line Corridor envisioned as a social housing corridor where a large share of the housing is actually owned by either nonprofits, well, by nonprofits. Um, and we could do that, you know, I think we could do that over time. If we were to provide enough funding for, you know, HOC and MHP and all of these groups to, to purchase these buildings one at a time, and then they can actually redevelop them in time. And you can take a 300 unit garden building and replace it with a thousand unit building, but it's owned by the public, you know, by the, uh, someone with a public mission. And then you can really ensure your, your long-term viability of workforce housing, deeply affordable housing and market housing kind of all together. So anyway, that's something we should probably take a harder look at in the, in the, as the council reviews the, this plan and see if there aren't ways we can strengthen that. Thank you, Kay. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, so I wanna recognize that we're, we're getting down to the wire on time. So maybe these next few questions can be uh, a little bit like a lightning round because we have a lot of really good questions that I'll try, deserve, I'll try to be quicker in my answers. deserve long answers. Um, and any of these topics, I mean, and that's why, you know, there are going to be many work sessions in the Fed committee because all of these topics deserve like very long conversations. Uh, but I'm going to go next to Denise Guitara um, to have her ask her question. Uh, thanks, Jane, and thanks so much, Councilmember Reamer, for, for being with us uh, this evening. Uh, my question, I think you kind of just answered it in your, in your last response, but I'll still ask, um, which is how will the council ensure the development and redevelopment as part of Thrive is fair and equitable and not cause displacement of lower income and largely BIPOC communities in the county? Yeah. And also, I'm really glad to hear um, your remarks on the earlier question of how you're thinking of pairing up more uh, urban um, development with a higher increase in water quality and tree cover. Thank you, Denise. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of our essential goals in our master plans. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we passed legislation that I authored that raised the MPDU requirement in our higher income neighborhoods. But, um, you know, we have a lot more to do to ensure that redevelopment is, is equitable. And I think a big part of that is gonna be partnering with our nonprofit housing providers and helping them buy buildings and then put them into ownership and then retaining them for the long term. So that's really been my vision. Uh, I think the Purple Line Corridor is, is a really good example of a corridor where there are higher concentrations of lower income and or BIPOC residents. And I think a great solution to ensure that those communities are always going to have home in the Purple Line Corridor, which we also know is gonna be an economic engine for the county, is to place a large share of the housing under public ownership or nonprofit ownership. And we could do that by targeting our public funds into the corridor working with our nonprofits and trying to buy a large share of the housing supply there and then expand it over time through redevelopment. So that's my vision for that corridor. And I think it's a, it's a realistic way actually to address that important challenge. Thank you. 
All right, next question, I'm going to go to Allison Gillespie. Uh, she asked a really interesting question about county agencies working together. Hi, Hans. Um, thanks so much for, for your words tonight. It's very interesting points. I'm wondering, does the general plan at all enable uh, county government agencies? Does it set the stage for them to work better together? Um, the example I would give is how can we, for instance, make large parks like Wheaton Regional or Cabin John Re Regional Park more mass transit accessible, more accessible to pedestrians, more bike friendly? Um, often it's really hard to get the agencies sort of together because the master plan process currently doesn't necessarily set the stage. General plan at all help in that way or how can we overcome that problem? And That's an interesting question. I mean, I, I think, for example, the work that you've been doing with the Open Streets Coalition is addressing that problem. Um, and I think you're, you're, you're starting to invent a new approach you and, and, and a number of other community activists. I think many of them are on this call. You're, you're kind of inventing a, a new approach of resident led, um, you know, collaboration with the county government agencies uh, to provide for park amenities or, you know, improved, you know, the, the, the bikeways and the, the, the slow streets and the closed streets. Um, I don't know if the general plan will necessarily move that ball forward, but um, you know we should think about if there's a way that it could. Um, you know, it's it's kind of at sixty thousand feet, um, but uh, I'd love to explore if there is a way to to speak more to that vision and you know help that as guidance, help provide that as guidance to to future master plans. And I, I want to just note uh, a number of folks have commented on concerns that the centers are not enough of a focus and it's the corridors. Um, you know, let's, let's follow up on that and let's, let's make sure it, that it's something that's not being lost. I, I suspect that the view of the planning team may have just been that they've developed, you know, we've, we've kind of already done the centers more or less. Uh, I, I don't know if, that, if that's why it's not as high of, a, of an emphasis. Um, I think it's, they're trying to emphasize what hasn't been done more than maybe what has, but uh, you know we ought to make sure. And that mess of a map that you saw is, you know, a map of the corridors and the centers, and that's why there's so many different, you know, visual points on it, and it's a little confusing. But yeah, it's trying. They're trying to fit a lot into one map, which I definitely have sympathy for. So <laughs> let's follow uh, up on that, though. It's an interesting. Yeah. Um, for our, we're at 7.30, so I want to squeeze in one more question, if that's okay, from Paul Goldman. All right, Paul, I've asked you to unmute. Go for it. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Councilmember Robert, you had mentioned uh, in, in your remarks the uh, greater emphasis on reimagining, re uh, you know, the, the main corridors that go through Montgomery County, whether it's Rockville Pike or Viewsmill Road or Route 29, uh, what have you. Uh, I guess to, to ask a nitty gritty question, uh, in, terms of in terms of transportation, it seems like a lot, some of that reimagining will have to do with how the uh, roadway capacity is allocated right now. Uh, you know, certainly uh, uh, automobile traffic dominates to the extent that the plan uh, wants to encourage more biking or more use of buses through things like separated uh, bike lanes, separated bus lanes, that would involve reallocating uh, space away that that's currently uh, used for automobile traffic. Uh, would the master plan have features, uh, the, the general plan have features that would make that easier to realize? Yes, absolutely, 100%. Um, one of the things that has been amazing to me to learn as I've done my work at the council is how much of the land use that we see, that the housing types and the, you know, the built environment that we see is actually um, influenced by the transportation strategy and the transportation tests. In other words, 
we have a longstanding framework that we're we're sort of undoing or breaking, you know, re refining. I think I'm not sure what the right phrase would be, but we're improving. Um, we have a long-standing framework, and it's a very suburban mentality about, you know, traffic must be at such and such level in order to be acceptable. And one of the problems with that rather narrow thinking is that if you insist that every intersection operate at a certain level of, you know, free flow, well, the only way to do that is to widen lanes, to build overpasses, to you know, reduce the amount of time that people have to cross the street. And so what you've had, I think, over the years is a built environment that was heavily influenced by an unseen force, which was the transportation you know, adequacy tests that determined what the roads would look like which then profoundly influenced what the housing would be like next to it and whether there was any room for people to walk on the side and whether there was a bike lane in the road. And one of the things we've been working really hard to you know, kind of revolutionize is that uh, all of our master plans now have a much more forward thinking approach to transportation adequacy and providing options for all, all modes rather than just simply the adequacy of one mode. And actually, I think what, what this plan does is kind of codify that. You know, this, this general plan is sort of saying we're recognizing and we're making it, we're making it a deeper policy that that's what we're going to keep doing. And, you know, we're, we're still battling this out. I mean, we just passed the Shady Grove minor plan. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, and there was, you know, quite a discussion about some of the intersections in that plan and target speeds, and and a lot of that stuff was being influenced by how many, you know, what's the tra what's the congestion standard for that given area, and it's funny because everyone sort of thinks I think it's natural to think, well, we all want low traffic, and so it must be good to have a low a, a standard of a low level of of congestion. And then what you find out is in order to, for the, if you put in a, the standard must be a low level of congestion, in order to achieve that, you have to turn your road into a highway. Right. And that's how you end up with highways all over instead of roads for people, you know, for different modes. And that is basically what happened in this county for like 50 years. It's really the modern transportation planning regime. And we're trying to kind of break that apart. And we've been breaking that apart through our SSP, our growth policy rewrites. You know, we just passed the updated growth and infrastructure plan, it rewrites a lot of that. We've, we've also been rewriting that through a lot of the master plans on a sort of locational basis. Um, and then I think this general plan is almost sort of saying, you know, this is what we've been doing, or this is what we, we should keep doing what we've been doing in a way. But then it's also going to be stronger guidance because now I think as the planning process proceeds, you know, people can point to the document and say, that's why we're doing it. So thank you, Paul. All right. for the question. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Great answer. Um, with that, I will bring our conversation to a close um, and thank uh, Council Member Reamer so much for being here today. Um, and for answering all of those questions and we're very excited to work with you through the process of, um, of finalizing and passing Thrive. Uh, you will be hopefully seeing uh, as many of these faces again as possible uh, at the public hearings or public that, hearing. You, you said it was scheduled for May. That's good. Is that, is that, that's on no, the council? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. There's a question mark <laughs> after that. Okay. <laughs> I, I hope it will be, you know, I, I will, um, I think that would be great if we could do our public hearings in May, and then that, that would allow us to do Fed committee meetings throughout the summer. Uh, you know, well, throughout the summer, really June, half of June and July. Right. I think it's unlikely we'll be able to finish the plan at committee. You know, in but maybe maybe we can finish our committee review uh, by by that time, 
and then send it on to the council for action in September. Um, in September, okay, that is interesting and good to know. We do have a condensed timeline to make this happen, you know, and it, it would probably be wise to get as much of it done as we can, you know, sooner rather than later, because the whole election environment starts to change people's views of things a little bit. Um, so in any event, I, I, I know we charted out a timeline that was pretty aggressive, you know, and, and we'll, we're going to try to stick to that as best we can. I'll add the question marks back in. <laughs> you, you should Bottom. definitely advocate for public hearings in May. I would, I would recommend that. And, and I, you know, if you, if you don't mind, just follow up with me and I'll, re, it'll remind me to go talk to the council president's office and see when, if it's been scheduled yet. Great. I mean, I've, if it has not been publicly posted, cause I check every day <laughs> to see if they, well, there, if there has been, been a, uh, you know, folks can certainly leave if they want to leave, but I, I I'm just going to share, you know, we're just, yeah, talking. please so, do. there has been a, um, a, uh, you know, a desire at the council to postpone things that are not COVID related mm -hmm. because we are spending a lot of our time dealing with the COVID crisis. And there's kind of, you know, it's, it's hard to process big issues when you're spending half of your time just worrying about the vaccination rollout and, and you know, updating public health guidance about how many people can be in, you know, inside of a restaurant. It just doesn't leave a lot of time. So, we have been generally trying to postpone things. However, you know, land use is still the county council's sacred exclusive authority. And, you know, we, we really need to stick to executing on, on that important responsibility. So, um, you know, I, I'm sure we can allow public hearings and then we'll just get it rolling as fast as we can. But there might be a tendency to say, oh no, Nothing, nothing big, nothing new until later. Uh, and I think we wanna make sure we, uh, you know, get this on the council agenda. Right, absolutely. Um, and, and as for, you know, public involvement in, in this uh, throughout the pandemic, it has been pretty extraordinary to see how involved people have continued to be. Um, the, the planning board public hearing, we had over 80 people at that. Um, which is why I think it would be great if there were multiple public hearings for this. I'm not sure if that's the plan or not, but I know that there is a lot of interest and with things being virtual, um, it seems like more people than ever are really, are really passionate about, about creating. Yeah, it's been exciting to see. Very exciting to see all the participation, not even miss a beat, you know, going to virtual uh, and actually even grow. So a lot of innovation through this crisis. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, I think we'll we'll definitely strongly advocate to to move as quickly on Thrive as possible. Um, and to to everybody on this call, I will be reaching out to you about that. Um, and and this will not be the last time you hear from me. I'll be in your email for sure. Uh, our next meeting will be May thirteenth with Planning Commissioner Natalie or Natalie Fanny Gonzalez. Uh, so I hope that you all will come out for that as well. Um, and with that, I will uh, let you all get back to your back to your evenings. And thank you all so much again for coming. And again, huge thank you to Councilmember Reamer. Thank you so much, everyone. Really glad to thank be with you, you today. Take care. Bye.